Like a giant hand was behind my head, and it slammed my face down into the radio below me. And my face impacted on that, and I bounced back up like a jack in a box. And for some reason why, I don't know, I looked left through a veil of blood because blood was running over my eyes. The captain's profile, corn stalks going by. I had instantaneous thought that it's true, they really do grow the corn that tall in Iowa. Captain in a DC-10 sits about 22 feet above the ground. They don't grow it that tall. That impact had taken out our landing gear. There was this terrible sounds, tearing of metal, G-loads. There's yaw to the right. And simultaneous with that change of direction was this sensation that something was like drop kicking your backside. You could feel yourself coming up and over, head over heels. The windshield went completely green and brown. Split second, cold air blowing on my left shoulder. The windshield lightened for a split second, darkened a second time. Heat and humidity and violence beyond any words I could ever hope to put forth. My next recognition was being still. I was upside down. I had mud in my eyes and my ears. I couldn't hear, I couldn't see, I couldn't move. I could feel the blood flowing up my face to my ears and up to my hair. Tremendous pain. My ribs were broken and they punctured my right lung cavity and stuck in there. Just couldn't get a breath of air. I've got to stay conscious. Uh, if I lose consciousness, I'm probably going to lose it. I have to fight to stay conscious. We ended up in four distinct pieces. We landed with the right wing down. The wing ruptured open, and 11,000 pounds of kerosene came out and started on fire. The wing that dipped on landing, that was the wing that was always going yeah, down? the right wing, yeah. The damn thing always wanted to go down. The engine itself was totally demolished by the impact because it smashed into the ground once the gear fell. The tail broke off and tumbled down the runway at 200 plus miles an hour with people in it. The airplane was in a cartwheeling motion because the engine on the left wing is now running at maximum power like a pinwheel, it's just causing the, the airplane to rotate because the engine's pushing it around. When the tail broke off, the airplane is much heavier forward, so the airplane is now coming up in the air like a seesaw that somebody got off. And the cockpit is getting pointed straight to the earth, and we skip like a pogo stick. The first skip, when I saw the windshield go dark brown and green and I still felt the air conditioning, we were still integral to the aircraft. The stress caused the cockpit to break off like a pencil tip. The main wreckage slammed on its back and slid into a cornfield across an active runway. Burn in there. Debris everywhere. What seemed like an eternity was in fact 30 minutes before we were found. Our engineer, Dudley Dvorak, was able to get his hand up through some wreckage, and somehow he drew attention to somebody driving by. The guy said, what is this? It's the cockpit. There's four of us in here. The Air National Guard brought over a huge forklift truck with chains and tried to lift it so that the fire rescue people could climb underneath and cut us out of our seats and get us out of there. The cockpit had become so dismembered that it was basically a pile of trash. Whenever they lifted us with change, it compacted us in tighter. We'd scream in pain because it just made it worse, so they put you back down and then try to rearrange change. I felt a hand just tap me on the chest. Don't worry, buddy, I got you. You're gonna be fine, we got you. And uh, salvation. My wife was home at the time. She's been married to me from the day I started pilot training in the Air Force. Whenever an airplane crash happened anywhere in the world, she would get a phone call from our friends, and the question always was, where's Denny? 
And this time when the phone call came in, where's Denny? She said, well, hopefully he's on his way home from Denver. Our friend said, oh, dear God, Gene Anna, United DC-10 from Denver to Chicago has just crashed in Sioux City. It's on CNN. And she dropped to her knees in tears. Tragedy in Sioux City. A United Airlines plane carrying nearly 290 people crashes at the Sioux Gateway Airport. I never told her I was going to be on that airplane. I never said what flight I was going to be on. I could have been on the previous flight, could have been on the last flight, but she knew intuitively that was me. The plane was en route to Chicago from Denver when it had engine trouble and later lost hydraulic And pressure. if you turn on the television and see that crash, the only conclusion you could draw is, he can't be alive. Nobody could live through that. We had friends gather, and basically it was a death watch at the house. And a phone call came in four and a half hours later from the chaplain at Sioux City. Told my son, your dad's here, he's got a broken arm, he's skinned up, looks like he's gonna be okay. The next day, a friend of mine got together a twin engine airplane and got my youngest son, Brian, and my wife to Sioux City. Asked for me, and they said, well, he's in intensive care. No, no, you, there's gotta be some mistake. We were told he had a broken arm and skinned up. That's true, he has all those injuries, but we almost lost him last night, and he's not out of the woods yet. They come into the room, and my son's 13 years old. I am black, blue, purple, green, machines, pipes, tubes, and I'm three times my normal size. He doesn't recognize me, he's terrified. My wife walked over to me, and uh, I was on the morphine, and you know it has a lucid quality. Whenever it wears off, you're lucid for a moment before the next input. She looked at me and I opened my eyes and I saw her looking back at me and, and she said, hi, I'm here. I love you, we can do this. Not you can do this, you poor slob, we can do this. The soulmate of mine was not gonna let me go down. I said, honey, I need to know two things. And she said, what is it? And I said, did I make the runway? Because our salvation was at that runway. I had to get this airplane on a runway. That's where the emergency people were. That's where the response capability was. That's where the trained personnel were. It meant everything to me. That runway was absolutely critical. And she said, yes, you made the runway. And with that knowledge, I had hoped that even though as beat up as I was, that everybody else was okay. And my next question was just that, is everybody else okay? And she realized I didn't know the truth. And she started to cry had my answer, and I cried for three days every waking moment. There's 112 people that did not make it that day. Some of them I knew, some I didn't. And I would have traded gladly my life for theirs, because I had the responsibility in my eyes. We as a crew were able to save 184. But the rationale that these people lived otherwise would, and because of our actions, doesn't somehow suffice to take away these feelings. They carry black boxes on all airliners, and post-accident, they will get the information extracted from the last 30 minutes from the voice recorder and for the entire flight from the flight data recorder. They're able to load a simulator of the same type aircraft and put in the same circumstances. So